Hi, and welcome. Today we're going to be doing part three of our locks and keys series. So we're going to be talking about global cycles, and uh, today the key we are looking at is gate 10. So buckle up, we have quite the ride. Gate 10, the nature. Every gate has a special keynote for locks and keys, and if it's a I mean, I should say for the locks anyway. So all eight of the lock gates have their own keynotes. And we were looking at, you know, for instance, the temple for gate 46 or um, the witness for gate 25. Well, here we have gate 10, the nature. And this is the lock. This is a perennial lock. Every era has its nature. Every era, people have a certain nature or are conditioned to have a certain nature, encouraged to have a certain nature. And that nature that they're encouraged to have is going to be the key, the key to that era. Uh, we currently have gate nine as the key. Or if you're watching this after 2027, we previously had gate nine as the key. And we'll be talking about uh, that move and what it is to move from gate nine to gate 34. But first, I want to talk a little bit about gate 10. So these are just a few notes I've taken. Treading on the tail of the tiger. This is the Chinese hexagram. This is, you know, if you get this in an I Ching reading, be careful. It means that you might step on the tail of a tiger. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know, be careful. Don't, you should watch your behavior, right? Uh, but of course, we don't use the I Ching that way in human design. We don't use it for divination. We, we look to the deeper meanings of the hexagrams and we look to how it's going to play out for someone now um, if you have personally gate 10 often you know unless it's gate 10 line 3 you're going to be like the best you would have been the best behaved kid growing up you know and imposing you know you have a behavioral code that is imposed on others and uh, someone who has gate 10 has a really hard time trusting people who don't have gate 10 because they don't have a behavioral code how can you trust them Gate 10 is considered one of the heaviest conditioning gates. That is, that it conditions others extremely heavily. Even in 1989, Rave I Ching, like that Ra wrote, you know, a couple of years after his experience or a year after his experience, even after, even the Rave I Ching, which was so early in the unfolding of human design, he pointed out gate 10 as the strongest conditioning force of all the gates. Um, maybe he didn't say the strongest, but he... Of all the gates, he doesn't talk about any of them being strong conditioning forces, except for this one. Now, obviously, later, you know, he would talk about the format channels or the defense circuitry, right? If you're around somebody and they have a 59.6 or they have a 50.27, that's going to condition you pretty heavily. Or if you hang out with me and my 9.52, that's going to condition you to focus, focus, focus. Or the 42.53 or the 360. So, obviously, there's there are points of heavy conditioning or there are stronger gates, but gate 10 is what conditions all of us to behave. It conditions our behavior. And it's funny because when I say behave, we all know what that means, but we only know what that means because the key to behavior has been gate 9. So we assume that behaving is gate 9-ing, focusing, right? Gate 9 is the line of focus, or the gate of focus. And so we tend to think of behavior as focus, but that is not what behavior is. There's all different kinds of behavior to ensure survival. And while focus might help ensure survival in the cross of planning era, it's not gonna do much for the cross of the sleeping phoenix era. We're gonna need different behavior. We're gonna need to learn to behave differently. Those of us who are born before the change of the cycle, that is everybody alive today and everybody born within the next five years, we are always going to be confused by the behavior of the future. We are entering into a world that we will not understand. And it's not like suddenly 2027 hits and then we change. We are dinosaurs. We're staying the same our whole lives. We're always cross the planning. We, all that happens is we start to feel like an alien in a strange land, even more so if you don't have any sixth or, th or third lines in your profile. I'm a 5'1", so I'm, I'm really going to be useless to the new era. I'm very useful right now. I am very useful right now. I actually have gate nine, um, line one, triple activated, which is the current key. So I have a lot of, I have the key to behavior right now, you know, um, and I condition others in that way, even though I don't have gate 10, but just through the outer authority. 
But um, I just want to stick with gate 10 for a while. So this is a very complex, very multi multivalent, you know, multiple meanings of this gate. Here's one of the more mystical notes I, uh, I took from what Ra said. Where the vessel gets poured out. <laughs> right? It's kind of an interesting one. Where the vessel gets poured out. The vessel of love he's talking about. And then he says, the vessel is poured out into each of us. The vessel of love. This, so it conditions the world's behavior. That means if every gate 10 were to suddenly vanish, there would be no code of behavior. No one would know how to behave publicly. People would walk around naked. People would be picking their nose. People would be jumping up and down on tables and people would be screaming instead of, you know, and all of this stuff. I mean, this is what keeps people in line is that conditioning force of gate 10. And each era is going to have a very strong push to behave a certain way. Our current era, that is to behave through focus, gate nine. And we'll go talk about that in a moment. Self-love grounded in living in the world. This is the way Ra describes it. And he just points out, behavior makes life easier. That's all it is. It's about, it's, you can't love being in the world and you can't have that self-love of living in the world and being in the world if it's hard all the time and what makes it easier? Behavior. Behavior makes it easier. Everyone in human design knows that. Human design is all about behavior and it's all about self-love. And if I walk up to somebody and I behave like, hey, hey you, pay attention to me, that's going to create a lot of resistance. I mean, if a generator walks in the room and says, how's it going, that creates resistance. If I walk in the room and say, good morning, it creates resistance. I am designed to wait to respond. And every time I misbehave by initiating, it creates resistance. Behavior is here to make life easier. With the 1020, we find that being yourself is the potential to waking up. You can't wake up unless you really are yourself, you know. It's also the code of behavior of the lines. So that's what's interesting. If you look at how each line has its own code of behavior, where it has to behave that way. The fourth line has to behave by waiting for the opportunity. The second line has to behave by withdrawing and putting up walls. You know, each of the lines has its code of behavior that it kind of has to do in order to fulfill its purpose. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's self-love through living in the world, and living in the world gets easier when you know how to behave. And every era has a mode of behavior that it's encouraging, that it's kind of trying to get everybody on board with, a sort of project, if you will, for behavior. And the project for our era, which is from 1615 to 2027, is gate nine, focus. This has been the key. The taming power of the small. Potential fulfilled through detailed attention to all aspects. So this is what's going away. People don't believe me. And you know, people like to say, well, we're already seeing 2027. Sure, but People born today are still born with the cross of planning. They're still born with the ability to fulfill their potential through detailed attention to all aspects. They are still capable of that detail work. They're still capable of taming the details. People in the future are not going to be. They're just not. They're not going to have that capability. I'm talking about people born after 2027. So people who are 30 years old, 25, uh, 35 years from now, right? If they're 35 years old, sorry, if they're 30 years old and it's 35 years from now, that means 2062. So what I'm saying is in 2062, you're going to have 30-year-olds, a lot of them, all of the 30-year-olds and, and younger, right, are going to be, um, have potential fulfilled through, fulfilled through detailed attention to all aspects. They're not going to have access to that. They're not going to be able to fulfill their potential through detail. They're not going to be able to pay attention to all the different aspects. They're not going to have the attention span. They're not going to want to learn computer programming and, you know, obscure detail work. That's not going to be what it's about. Taming here is about mastering detail. Mastering detail. That's, you know, what's funny is it's being replaced by the power of the great. And that's about mastering, you know, the expression of power, the display of power even, not even not even direct acting out from that power, but simply displaying that power. 
And we'll get to that in a moment, but what a difference for the world to change from where we all have this ability to pay attention and focus on details at our fingertips to where nobody has that ability anymore, unless, of course, you have gate nine in your chart. So there's still going to be roughly a third of people in the world who are going to have gate nine in some capacity. It's simply not going to be useful anymore in the same way it is, at least to the totality. Obviously, to fulfilling your own design and living your own design, uh, what you have available is, is just what you need. But as far as the totality is concerned, we're not going to really care about the details. Energy to fulfill through attention. This is what we're losing. See, think about it. The gate of behavior, for the last 400 years, it's been telling us to pay attention, to focus. So think about that. You go to school, what do they do? Focus. Stop, stop goofing off in the back. Stop having your side conversations. Pay attention here, pay attention here, pay attention here. They force you to pay attention, right? That's gonna change when everybody's on their cell phones. You can't force people to pay attention if they're on their cell phone, you know? They have their attention somewhere else. We are already seeing some of that. But energy to fulfill through attention. This is what we're losing. And this is what we've had. And think about it, it's not just school. You go to your job, pay attention, focus. You go on a date, you're meeting someone for the first time. That should be a romantic, relaxing, no, focus, focus, focus. Don't act bored, don't look away, make sure you pay attention to them. I mean, anything you read about sales techniques or any of this stuff is all about focusing on the other person. And This is all about the behavior we expect. Jacques Lacan used to really mess with people. He'd really get a rise out of them because you know he was very suspicious of positive transference. He much preferred negative transference. Not transference in the human design sense, but positive transference means when you really, really like your doctor, you get a little crush on them. And he wanted to do away with that. He much preferred negative transference, which is when you really, really don't like your doctor. And so he would try to encourage negative transference because he felt it was easier to overcome the negative than the positive transference. So someone would show up and they'd be telling him, telling him about their life problems, and then he would absentmindedly light a cigar, and then he would start going through his paperwork and ignoring them. He would keep his phone on the ground, and he would sometimes pick up the phone and make a call in the middle of them talking to him. I mean, you can see how annoyed people would be by this, because we all just expect the other to pay attention. Focus, pay attention. You know, that's what the program is yelling at us. And the real question for the 9-1, that is gate 9, line 1, sensibility, this is about how do I maintain attention? How do I keep the attention going? We need patterns, we need logic. You know, you must fix the pattern to hold the attention. If you don't have a fixed pattern, you can't keep people's attention. So if I put out music and I start to introduce one element, dum 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 dum, that's the pattern, it keeps repeating. And then da 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 the next part of the pattern. And then pretty soon I have your attention, where's the pattern gonna go? What's going to happen? I mean, this is how any film works, they have to put in a pattern. You have to kind of have a feeling of who's the protagonist and who isn't and all this stuff. Otherwise, it won't keep your attention. There must be a pattern. So the 9-1 is trying to fix the pattern to hold the attention, but it ends up with a lot of restlessness. So that's interesting, too, that we've had a lot of restlessness in the world. Um, von Franz said, right in the, I think it was in the 1960s or 1970s, she said, um, I don't know if she used the word restlessness. I think she said, uh, what word did she use? It was something, it's a very similar word to restlessness, but it's the modern malaise. It's essentially, um, oh, she called it the, the provisional life, provisional living, that everybody is so restless that they're just provisionally living as if life will really begin when they settle down. And there's a certain restlessness of modern life. And it's funny that she was talking about this in the 60s and 70s when it was actually, um, February 20th, 1961, that we entered into the first line here, which does include, as one of its themes, restlessness. Pluto transited gate nine from 1997 to 2000. So everyone born for those that period of time, two or three years, has gate nine. That's also interesting. And I, I do like to see the participation of the outer planets with the... Um, with the locks and keys, it's always interesting to see when you get transits to the locks and keys from the outer planets. Just a little note here, before 1961, we were in the gate nine line two. So I always like to, to look a little bit back 
here, and we can see that from 1896 to 1961, we were in gate nine, line two. That's called Misery Loves Company. Now the second line here is simply telling the world they can do it, whether or not they can. I can solve it. I can solve it. I focus, I can focus on it. Now here's the thing. What Ross says about this is that the second line always kind of has this superficiality that says, if I focus on my homework all day, I'll pass the class. Well, that's not true. Then they wonder, I studied all day. Why did I fail? Well, they failed because they were focusing on the wrong things and the focus was not, it wasn't the right focus. So it's interesting, it's, I, I do just wonder thematically the 1896 to 1961 era, obviously we were all being heavily conditioned to focus still, but a big part of it seems to be coming together to solve things together because one person comes out and says, I can solve it. And then the others say, well, wait a minute, you didn't really think about this and this and this, Let, we, we need to work together. So it's misery loves company is kind of the joke because they can't solve it. They say they can. I mean, this is, makes me wonder about like FDR, the new deal. Really, maybe it's one of those fake it till you make it second line themes where he says, hey, everybody, we're solving the problem. And then they all jump in to help out and then the problem does get solved. But again, uh, the nine two misery loves company says I can solve it, but that's the paper tiger. They say, I focused on this, that's all that matters, right? And they don't realize that if you focus on the wrong pattern or, you know, that it really, it is about more than just focusing. It's about fixing the pattern and focusing on the right pattern. And then before 1896, we had gate nine, line three. That was for around 70 years before that. And that's the straw that broke the camel's back. And so I, I haven't done a lot of keynoting or in-depth looking here, but it's kind of interesting to look at prior eras keys um, you know, to look at the keys from different eras and just kind of to ponder on them, or to look at the keys from the same era but different lines, which is kind of like having different keys. You know, um, the key now is at gate nine, line one. Before 1961, it was gate nine, line two. And then before 1896, it was gate nine, line three. And before 1820s, it was line four, and so on. So it is interesting to look at those keynotes vis-a-vis uh, -vis human behavior. And now we're changing into gate 34. So our, our new key, or if you're watching this post-2027, our current key is gate 34, power. The power of the great. And it's interesting because the 34-6 is actually about the refusal to use power, the idealism. See, gate 34 is all about the power where you know, someone gets in your way and you push them out of the way and you get in their way. And you, this is like the bully, you know, this is the bully. This is machismo. This is, this is a tough one. This gate 34 can be really violent. It doesn't need to be violent because one of the things is that it's really about the display of power as well, but not just the display of power. I mean, it is about power too. And it's the power to individuate. What Ross says, he calls it a very intense power field. We're going to end up gate 34, line one, in around 400 years, or 360 years, the Pluto detriment, the come up as, as the inevitable destiny of the bully. So 300 some odd years from now, all those bullies are going to get their comeuppance. But until then, we're going to go through quite a phase of bullying. Um, what does it mean when the code of behavior changes from focus to power, right? Now, for the next 70 years after 2027, it's gonna be in the sixth line. And the sixth line is reluctant to use the power. It says, I have all this power. You know, I'm a strong, powerful person. These weaklings keep coming to me and I keep pushing them away and they keep disobeying me and I keep punishing them and however it is. And I get sick of it. It says, I don't wanna to have to keep hitting you. I don't wanna to have to keep, you know, enforcing my power. I don't wanna to have to keep displaying this power. I wanna take a break from all this. I don't wanna do that anymore. It, this is the birth of idealism, is actually what Ross says. The birth of idealism is in gate 34, line 6. Because going the other way, starting at 34, 1, is the bully. It finally gets to the end, and it's so exhausted with the whole power business, it just says, I don't want to have anything to do with this ever again. And so it becomes idealistic. and says, well, maybe if I refuse to use my power, they'll just still, they'll stop doing the thing they shouldn't be doing, or whatever it is. I mean, you know, think about... Um, Right now we have Russia, Russia, Ukraine conflict going on. What is that if not a display of power? And it's going to be interesting to see, is it just the display? That's really the question. Is it just the display? So, you know, Ross says power is about display, not violence. But unfortunately, it often does turn to violence. 
So we're, we're entering into a new era where the behavioral code is about displaying power. And the behavioral code is about resorting to violence when the display of power, or even resorting to violence as display of power, when lesser means uh, are not, are not, not fruitful. So now I just have a few notes just on previous, previous keys, because I thought it'd be kind of interesting. From 1203 to 1614, we are in the cross of consciousness as, at the global cycle, at the global externalization theme. And the key was gate five. And so that was interesting to me, because I'm like, okay, the key was gate five. The gate of fixed rhythms is actually what the nine is trying to get to. The nine's trying to get to the five to have the fixed rhythm so it can keep focusing and paying attention. So it's funny, we, there is a relationship here. I always like seeing the relationship of the gates. And so the key was gate five. And I, I didn't take a lot of notes on this. I just kind of wrote, it was gate five, and then I wrote some of the historical events that happened during the key gate five. In 1206, we had Genghis Khan. That was right at the beginning of Cross of Consciousness. In 1215, Magna Carta. In the 1450s, we had the fall of Constantinople and the beginning of Gutenberg printing. And then right at the very end of the Cross of Consciousness, which kind of got, got it set up for the Cross of Planning, we have the invention of the watch for for telling time, pretty big. We have Martin Luther with the Protestant Reformation, and we have Cortez and Shakespeare. So, you know, I don't necessarily have a lot of comments here, but it's just interesting to see when things emerge. I always associate Shakespeare with the cross of planning. It also shows us that the sixth line of the previous cross is very heavily moving into, or I'd rather the first line of the previous cross, excuse me, is moving into that sixth line we're already getting to see kind of some of that, those themes emerge. Because a lot of the themes of Protestantism with sort of the theme of um, not wanting the church to be an arbiter of your direct connection to God, that's very much like the 3740, prove it to me, and the scientific revolution and the enlightenment and all of this stuff that happened during the cross of planning. So yeah, we, we do see that at the end of each cross, there's overlap with the next cross. But yeah, having the key to behavior being gate five, I guess that's just saying, be in your habit, be in your fixed rhythm, eat food at the same time every day, you know, go to church at the same time every week. That was 1203 to 1614 is when humanity at behaviorally developed the fixed pattern of behavior, of doing the same thing every day, doing the same thing every week, doing the same thing every month, and so on. And this really repetitive, very fixed pattern of behavior that developed and emerged in humanity in the 13th to the 16th century. Going back a little further, we have the cross of rulership, and that's so perfect. Cross of rulership started 791 to 1202. Well, 800 was the time of Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire, which would uh, last for a thousand years, right? So talk about rulership. <laughs> we have the schism, uh, the Greek-Latin schism. We have in 1088 in... Bologna, or Bologna. We have the first university. Um, you know, it's, yeah, so, and the key during that time was 26. So the behavior then was entrepreneurship. Ra had gate 26, and he joked he could spit in the desert and make a garden. So that time from 791 to 1202, everyone was expected, first of all, to act as T cells. There was a lot of terminating of each other. You know, the, the 26 can be really violent too. It's just like 34, right? And then also they're meant to be, um, to have the nerve to go out there and create it themselves. It's like manifest destiny a little bit. And so that kind of emerged as the behavioral stamp for humanity during that time. Gate 26, everyone's expected to be an entrepreneur. Everyone's expected to be able to, um, it's the strength gate, or was the, is 51 the strength of the, um, the ego? But either way, it's the T cell. It's the I mean, the, the ego, the ego has some inter interesting gates. You know, you have twenty one, gate twenty one. God, I'm I'm glad that hasn't been a behavioral code. You know, can you imagine if twenty one was was the behavioral code, the the control and the discipline? Ha, huh, scary. Going back a little further, we have from three seventy nine to seven ninety. This is really nice. That was the cross of Eden. So that was like Eden, three seventy nine to seven ninety. And during that time, we have the fall of Rome. We have the birth of Muhammad. In 730, we have uh, printing was invented in, in China. 
And the key during that time was gate 11. So that was a time when the behavioral code, everyone was expected to have ideas. They were expected to produce ideas for, for what they should do and to share those ideas, very collective. You can see how different that is, you know, moving from a collective key to a tribal key. Each key has so much to say about that era. And, uh, but during that time of Eden, where the externalization of the world was Eden from the fourth to the eighth century, uh, the key was gate 11, and the behavioral code of humanity was to have ideas. This gives you such a different perspective on the past. You know, we've all heard about the past, we've all read about the past, but to really imagine what it would be like to be alive at a time when the behavioral code was not to pay attention, but to have ideas, right? Pretty interesting. And then the last one, I'm not gonna go back too far BC, 33 BC to 378 AD was the Vessel of Love. And that's where the Vessel of Love keys were for the locks of the Vessel of Love. So the keys were to their locks, right? The keys were in sync with their locks. And uh, so, you know, the key to gate 10 was gate 10 during that time. And during that era, slightly before, we 27 BC, we have the founding of Rome. We have the time of Jesus. We have the invention of paper in 105 AD. We have the unification of China in the 3rd century and Constantine in the 4th century, in 312 AD. So looking from this time of Christ, common era, to 378 AD, yeah, I mean, that, that's another interesting, how do you deconstruct when the key to gate 10 is gate 10? I mean, I, I think it would simply be um, that each person in that time was really expected to behave according to to their, um, I mean, that is like, they have to be careful not to, to try to, to tread on the tail of the tiger, right? So the core theme of gate 10 is to avoid um, the resistance you get from misbehavior. So, you know, when gate 10 is the key to the lock of gate 10, this is like extremely, extremely important. This is everybody learning to behave. This is the world collectively learning. If you don't behave, you get killed. If you don't behave, you get resistance. If you don't get, if you don't behave, you don't get food. If you don't behave, you get kicked out to the outside of the wall. You don't get to come back in, you know. So this is humanity learning how to behave at a most fundamental level, where the key gate ten to the lock gate ten, and that was around. That was from 33 BC to 378 AD. All right, that's it for me today. Thanks for tuning in, and love to hear your comments and. Uh, yeah. Do you have gate 10? What is your experience with it? Do you have gate 9? Do you have gate 34? I have 9 and 34. So um, I guess my 34 will come in handy in the new era. We'll, we'll see.